They were some of the wealthiest families ever. Their empires ruled industries, and they had more money than entire countries. While their workers earned cents per day, these robber barons amassed fortunes well into the hundreds of millions, if not billions. They had everything, and yet many of these families today are left penniless. So what happened to their fortunes? Let's go. Starting off this list is the main man, John D. Rockefeller, who is most well known for his company Standard Oil, which in the 1880s owned about 90% of all American oil refineries. By the time he died at the ripe old age of 97 in 1937, he amassed a fortune well over $1.5 billion, which equated to about 1.5% of the US GDP at that time. Now with the current US GDP around 25.44 trillion, that means John D. Rockefeller's 1.5% in today's economy would be worth $381,600,000,000. During his lifetime, John D. Rockefeller gave away hundreds of millions of dollars to all sorts of causes, religious, scientific, and educational. In 1913, Rockefeller set up the Rockefeller Foundation, where he and his family continued to make generous donations. He donated $75 million to help found the University of Chicago, and $50 million each to the Rockefeller Institution for Medical Research, Rockefeller University, and the General Education Board. When John D. Rockefeller died, the remaining money went to his son, John Jr. Also, by that time, the Rockefellers had many trusts in place to ensure that future generations were taken care of. Currently, David Rockefeller Jr., fourth generation, is the head of the family and also a board member for the Rockefeller Capital, where some of their money is stored today. Now currently there are about 200 Rockefeller descendants alive, and by no means is the family poor, it's just that the money is spread across all of these individuals, and it's a far cry from what John D. Rockefeller had himself. So as of 2024, the overall family fortune is around $10.3 billion. Next up on this list is a family you've probably heard of, but really know nothing about. And it starts with John Jacob Astor, who made his fortune in the fur trade, dealing opium, and in real estate. By the time of his death in 1848, John Jacob Astor had become the U.S.'s first millionaire, amassing a fortune well over $20 million, which was around 0.9% of the U.S. GDP at that time. But the family's fortunes don't stop there. John's son, William Backhouse Astor, more than doubled the family's fortune to over $50 million. Next came John Jacob Astor III, who again nearly doubled the family's fortune to between $75 and $100 million. After that came his son, William Waldorf Astor. You may know this name from the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. In short, William Waldorf Astor made the Waldorf Hotel. And then his cousin, John Jacob Astor IV, made the Astoria Hotel but the hotels were like right next to each other. And in typical millionaire fashion, there was bickering, there was fighting, there was potential legal issues. And then somehow they came together and decided, you know what, let's just combine the hotels to make the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Now here's where the story gets a bit more weird because William Waldorf Astor decided to move to Britain and become a British citizen. And eventually the first Viscount Astor of Hever Castle and John Jacob Astor IV ended up dying on the Titanic. We will continue with the American Astors. So John left his money to his son, Vincent, who then left his money to his wife, Brooke. Now, finally, this is where the fortune starts to disappear because Brooke was a very charitable individual and over the course of her lifetime gave away millions of dollars away to charity. And unfortunately, this is where we introduce a new character, Tony Marshall, her son from a previous marriage, and Tony was a not so nice character. Tony was a theater producer who had been divorced three times, so he clearly needed the money. Well, eventually, when he started running his mother's assets, he started paying himself an exuberant salary. When Brooke's health started to fail, he took more control, starting to convince her to sell off assets and priceless pieces of artwork, pocketing the money himself, and continuing to neglect his mother. As Tony continued to neglect his dying mother, Tony's son, Philip, stepped up and sounded the alarms. Tony was indicted on 16 counts, including conspiracy, grand larceny, and possession of stolen property. He was later found guilty of 14 of the 16 counts and was sentenced to prison time, but only served eight weeks because he was released on medical parole, dying a year later. And by that time, the fortune was all but gone. So yeah, quite a crazy story. Next up on this list is Andrew Carnegie. Now, fun fact, 
People typically say Andrew Carnegie, but he was from Scottish descent, so it's pronounced Carnegie. Anyway, Mr. Carnegie made his fortune in steel, specifically his company, U.S. Steel, and amassed a fortune well over $400 million, about $380 billion today. Now, like Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Carnegie was a very charitable man and over the course of his lifetime gave away over $350 million. Andrew Carnegie's philanthropic activities centered on libraries, education, science, and world peace. Mr. Carnegie helped found the building of over 2,500 libraries, paid for thousands of church organs, and founded Carnegie Hall in New York City, Carnegie Mellon University, the Carnegie Hero Fund, and the Carnegie Institute of Science and more. Towards the end of his life, he dedicated more of his time and passion towards world peace. He supported the founding of the Peace Palace in The Hague in 1903 and gave $10 million to found the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in 1910 to hasten the abolition of international war and worked ceaselessly for the cause until the outbreak of World War I. When Mr. Carnegie died, he still had a fortune of around $30 million, which a majority of it went to the Carnegie Corporation Endowment. Anything left of the family fortune went to his one and only daughter, Margaret Carnegie Miller. Moving on, we have the Vanderbilt family, who were once the premier family in America, founded by Cornelius Vanderbilt, who got his start in shipping. He got a loan of about $100, around $2,000 in today's money, from his mom and bought a shallow draft boat known as a periauger, and he named it Swiftsure. Eventually, through hard work, he amassed a massive fleet of ships and dominated the industry. Then, he discovered railroads and found them to be the future, eventually selling off all of his boats to fully pursue railroads. By the time he died in 1877, he was worth around $105 million, or over $200 billion in today's money. Now, side note, Mr. Vanderbilt did donate a million dollars to found Vanderbilt University, but that's really his only philanthropic endeavor. Anyway, a large majority of the fortune passed on to Cornelius' son, William Henry Vanderbilt, who managed to double the family fortune to $200 million by the time of his death nine years later. After William's death, the fortune was split between his four sons. Cornelius II got $80 million, William Kism got $60, Frederick got $10, and George II got $10. Now here is where the money starts to disappear, because the Vanderbilts were seen as new money, and the elites of New York City, who were old money, did not accept them. So, in order to impress their new friends, the Vanderbilts started spending money like crazy. Cornelius II built the breakers in Newport, Rhode Island. George II had the Biltmore in North Carolina built, which is still the largest home in America, spending over 175,000 square feet and 8,000 acres, originally 125,000 acres. And William built the Petite Chateau on Fifth Avenue in New York City. The family built and spent millions of dollars on real estate, of which many were eventually demolished not even a couple decades later. Furthermore, they threw parties, and we're talking some of the largest parties ever. Millions and millions of dollars in then money to try to impress their friends, the old money elites. It eventually worked, but it had the backfiring effect of causing the family fortune to disappear because they were spending so much money and a large portion of the family only wanted to be rich. They didn't want to take the time to actually build up the family fortune. And by the time of the third and fourth generation of the Vanderbilts, the fortune was gone. And finally, we have the Stroll family, founded in 1850 by Bernhard Stroll when he emigrated from Germany to the US, eventually settling in Detroit. This is where he started brewing his bohemian style Pilsner. In the beginning, he sold his beer door to door out of a wheelbarrow. And like any immigrant, Bernhard worked hard and eventually his beer company, the Stroll Brewing Company, was a powerhouse in the region. Steadily over time and through subsequent generations, the company grew to become a national brand. During the 1970s and 1980s, the fourth generation of Strolls continued to acquire other beer brands, expanding their overall reach. And by 1988, Forbes estimated the family's fortune to be around $700 million, or about $9 billion in today's money. However, at the same time, the family-owned company began to take on ever-increasing debts in the hopes of acquiring other brands. In addition to refusing to bring in outside talent to help run the company, continued errors in running the company, and large dividends paid out to the family members, the company began to collapse. By the turn of the century, the family had no choice but to sell its labels to its competitors' paps, and the family fortune and company were no more. Whether it is through generous donations, wasteful spending, or foolish descendants, most family fortunes don't really last past the third or fourth generation. 
Now this was honestly one of the more fun times I've had on a video because it was really interesting learning about all these families and their different dynamics. And a lot of them were interesting, but a fair amount of them were tragic. It is like what Cornelius the Commandor Vanderbilt said, any fool can make a fortune, but it takes a man of brains to hold on to it. And with that, I'm Evan, and thanks for watching. If you liked what you just saw, then click on the video here. Also, if you haven't, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos.